Marilyn came to her bedroom door. I was sitting in the living room, and she said, uh, Good night, Mrs. Murray. I think I'll turn in now. And she closed the door. And, of course, after that, I did the usual things about preparing the house for the night, and, and uh, I went to my room. At 3.30 a.m., alerted, she says, by some instinct, Mrs. Murray noticed the phone cord under Marilyn's door. Usually, Marilyn disconnected the phone at night. So, of course, I was alarmed. I called Dr. Greenson. This is essentially the story Mrs. Murray has told for 23 years. I went around to the front of the house before Dr. Greenson arrived. The bedroom curtains were closed. She went to get a poker. Turning the curtains back, I saw Marilyn lying on the bed, nude, and I was just alarmed. Not long after 3.30, Dr. Greenson arrived. He went round to the side of the house, broke the bedroom window, and entered. He wrote later, I could see that Marilyn was no longer living. There she was, bare shoulders exposed, the phone clutched fiercely in her right hand. Marilyn's own physician, Dr. Hyman Engelberg, was summoned, and the police called at 4.25. As I happened to talk to her on the phone that night, earlier in the evening, and she was happy in an manic phase. So I thought her mental state was good. She sounded cheerful. Apparently something happened to suddenly depress her. Peter Lawford got a call from Marilyn, and she was mumbling. Apparently she was going under from the pill she took, and perhaps was calling him as as a cry for help. He didn't run over. He called, he was the one who then called Mickey Rudin to tell Mickey Rudin that he'd had this call and Marilyn sounded funny and with Mickey check and that's when Mickey called the housekeeper. At approximately 10 p.m., Marilyn's attorney, Mickey Rudin, called Eunice Murray. Mrs. Murray assured him Marilyn was fine. Dr. Greenson got there first. She was dead when he got there and I went into the bedroom and made sure sure she was dead there was some rigor mortis yes but it wasn't extreme yet i suspected that she'd been dead at least a few hours i believed she was in a manic phase and that something happened to suddenly depress her and she grabbed pills there that she had plenty of pills at this bedside i think she was suddenly depressed and in that sense it was intentional then i think she thought better of it when she was felt herself going under because she called Peter Lawford. So while it was intentional at the time, I do believe that she changed her mind. At the side of her bed, there was a lot of second all, which I had never given her. Also, the autopsy showed that her liver had a lot of chloral hydrate. I never gave her chloral hydrate, and I don't think any doctor in the United States gave it to her. She must have bought it in, in Tijuana. Marilyn was stretched out, face down, in a soldier's position, catacomb of the bed. Obviously, she'd been placed in that position. And I was shown um, the nightstand by her table, by her bed, and it was about eight or ten uh, empty uh, bottles that had contained medicine, all barbiturates. Dr. Greenson said she must have swallowed them all. I looked in the bathroom uh, for a half-empty glass or a glass that had been used. There was none. I asked for, had anybody seen a document, any uh, written uh, statements, and no one had seen any written statements. There was no suicide note, and the only thing we had it there at that time was some empty bottles. And when you got to the house, who let you in? Mrs. Murray, the housekeeper. She became very concerned and called Dr. Greenson, who lived just a few minutes away. And what, if anything, did you ask Dr. Greenson? I asked... Uh, since this all occurred shortly after midnight, and uh, the call came to me at 4.25 a.m., I asked why it took four hours to call the police. What was the response, if any, from Dr. Greenson? Well, Dr. Greenson finally spoke up and he said they had to get permission from the publicity department of the studio before they could notify anybody. About three quarters of the way through the concert, someone came to our box and said, Arthur, come quickly. And he didn't realize, and he said, Marilyn is dead or she's on the point of death.
took Marilyn Monroe in on, on an overdose. And, of course, she succumbed at the hospital. You mean that you were called to the house and you took her alive in yes. coma? In coma, yes. She was, she was completely out. In her interview with us, Mrs. Murray departed from the story she's told before. She now says a doctor was called before Marilyn died. When he arrived, she was not dead. Because I was there, then, in the living room. If Mrs. Murray is confused by age or failing memory, Walt Schaefer is adamant that Marilyn, still alive, was taken to Santa Monica Hospital, where she died. How come the reports of her death all said she died in bed at home? Well, that is unbeknownst to me. I don't know. So far as you're concerned, there is no doubt that she was picked up and taken she to the hospital. She was alive when she... I went to the door and I opened it up and there stands Bobby Kennedy and I go, boy. Marilyn came rushing out of the bathroom all of a sudden and totally different than I would have expected her because she had on this really cruddy white robe that she liked to wear and she jumped into his arms and they started kissing madly and then uh, they settled down. We all sat down and we had another wine together and she goes, which means... Jeannie, go back to your apartment. A whiny voice. It was more of a, a frightened voice, a, a, a scared uh, voice and very tired. She said she had not slept the entire night. And I said, what's going on, Marilyn? She said, well, I've had a phone call after phone call with some woman calling me and saying, you tramp, you, you, you no good, uh, so-and-so. She said, um, leave Bobby alone or you're going to be in deep trouble. Sometime in mid or mid-evening, I got a phone call from Marilyn, and she was quite distressed and said, please, Jeannie, please come over. And I said, uh, I said, I can't. And uh, I said, I just can't. I just can't come over today. And she said, could you bring me some sleeping pills? And I said, no, I, I can't do it today, tonight, Marilyn. I just can't. Well, over a period of time, I was not at all surprised that the Kennedys were a very important part of Marilyn's life. And uh, so that I was just a, I wasn't included in this information, but I was a witness to what was happening. And you believe that he was here? At Marilyn's house? Yes. Oh, sure. That afternoon? Yes. And you think that is the reason that she I, was so upset? Uh, yes, and it became so sticky that the protectors of Robert Kennedy, you know, had to step in there and protect him. Marilyn was, um, from what Peter told me, knew then that it was over. You know, that was it, over, final. And um, she was very, very distraught and depressed and uh, perhaps even suicidal at the time. He said he went there. Um, he tidied up the place and did what he could before the reporters and what have you before. found out about the mm -hmm. death. There was no mention of a suicide note? No. And you saw no note anywhere near the body? No. I looked around for any notes, and I looked for any documents, and there were none in evidence. Did she leave a note? Yes, she did. What did it say? I don't know. No, it was destroyed. It was destroyed? Th who destroyed it? I'm sure Peter did. He told me he did. When I first saw Miss Monroe lying on the autopsy table, I was very sad. I felt this untimely death of a person uh, who had achieved what she had achieved. 
It was something that sort of represented the futility. Noguchi, whose own work was highly competent, later sent organ specimens for microscopic analysis. But the specimens were destroyed before the tests were done. That is a part of an autopsy, is doing the microscopic slides for diagnostic purposes and evaluation. And why wasn't that done in this case? I don't know. Would you have wished it to be done? Yes, indeed. And Noguchi wished it to be done? Yes. And it would have been normally routine to have made that kind of examination? That's true. What happened to the medical photographs that were taken? I have no idea. But they seem not to exist anymore. That appears to be true based on the content of that conversation with Dr. Greenson. I wrote a memorandum in which I indicated at least that I did not believe that Marilyn Monroe committed suicide. And that was Dr. Greenson's opinion? That was Dr. Greenson's opinion as well, yes. Minor says that for reasons of professional ethics, he can't disclose what Greenson said. One of the uh, reasons advanced for the highly secret nature of this investigation was that there could be some type of national security problem in connection with uh, the association between a, a national figure and, uh, and a uh, highly publicized uh, uh, entertainer. Chief Parker, says Redin, handled the case with extreme and quite unnecessary discretion. It was treated as an intelligence division operation and logically it could be so treated because there was the involvement uh, of uh, uh, the Attorney General of the United States. They treated it as a 100 percent intelligence operation and uh, those operations are highly secret. I began to wonder if they didn't have a file over there on Maryland's uh, death and all about it so I sent over to the police department for it and they told me that there wasn't any file. So I thought that maybe Chief Parker had taken the file to his home. But I never followed that up because I didn't want to bother Mrs. Parker. But that was my assumption, that there was a file, but it was taken out of the police department. But as mayor, you had the right to require the police department to give you any file they had, didn't you? Well, they sent me any file I asked for, always. Surely they wouldn't have gone so far as to have lied to the mayor, would they? Oh, they very possibly would have, sure. That's, it's easier to say there is no file than it is to say there's a file, Mr. Mayor, and you can't have it. Recently, however, the police department released the supposed file on Marilyn Monroe's death. It includes a rebuttal of an ancient magazine article and a handful of detectives' reports. Redin dismisses it as obviously incomplete. He wants to know the reason for the secrecy. If there was a national security implication, certainly put it under wraps. If there was none, uh, I would see no reason for keeping it under wraps. And frankly, what do you think the national security consideration was? Uh, I don't see. She had entries in there that um, Bobby is out to get Jimmy Hoffa and, quote, I'll put that SOB behind bars or no, or no what, something like that. Uh, she had entries in there regarding uh, Bobby told me that uh, he was going to have, uh, you know, Castro murdered. And uh, the entries, most of them began with Bobby told she was going to tell of the promises that he had made to her, which she considered lies and had misled her. She was going to tell about her affair with the two Kennedys, that's JFK and Robert Kennedy. And uh, I had asked her if she had told this to anybody else, meaning about the press conference coming up on Monday morning. And she said, yes, I've told a few people. And I told her, I said that I thought that would be very, very dangerous 
And she said, well, she didn't care at this particular point because she was going to come out and tell the truth because these people had used her. Now she was going to go and tell the real story. What uh, Hoffa wanted was me to uh, assist Bernie Spindell in developing a derogatory profile on Jack and Bobby Kennedy and their relationships with Marilyn Monroe, mainly, and any other woman uh, that might come into focus. And the strategy that was agreed upon was to use electronic devices. And the most logical place to to set those devices was they were placed on the carpets. They were placed uh, in the chandeliers and in ceiling fixtures. You know, you would have to look for the logical place to place the equipment. You have to gain entry also by either picking a lock or, or making some other kind of entry. As far as the wiretap is concerned, that's not something that the Secret Service uh, and that date and time could pick up because you could you could you could wire a telephone five miles from a location. It had to be right there. You know, and you're talking about the mob. Hoffa was the mob. You can't be the head of the Teamsters Union unless you're approved by the mob. It's a whole big black circle. Barford showed up and completely disorientated and uh, <clears throat> completely uh, in a state of shock. One saying that Malin Rose dead, Bobby Kennedy was there, uh, that he was spirited out of town uh, by some airplane back up north, that uh, they had gotten in a big fight that evening, and that he'd like to have me uh, make arrangements to, uh, to have someone go out to the house and pick up any and all information that was possible regarding any involvement between Mal Monroe and the Kennedys, whether it be diaries, whether they be <clears throat> notes, letters, etc. The conversation that came across the receiver was music, people talking, and it would fade in and fade out, and I then beginning to recognize the voices the Bostonian accent and Marilyn Monroe and I heard the word the president call Marilyn, Marilyn, or Marilyn calling the president press. Danoff now claims he was shocked to discover that the target of the operation was the president of the United States. The footsteps left the living, which I assume was the living room, and went into the bedroom where there was another transmitter which picked up all the activity in the bedroom, which was cuddly talk and taking off the clothes and the sex act in the bed you can hear the spring squeaking and so on and so forth. Marilyn immediately got on the phone to Peter grasping out to uh, inform him that she couldn't take anymore and that she was going to <clears throat> be best for everybody that she died and that she was going to kill herself. That afternoon, we all uh, hiked up to the top of the ranch and had a had a big uh, touch football game, which of course is a typical family sport of the Kennedys. Uh, so it was a it was a the only time that Bobby was out of my sight was from the time he went to bed, uh, sometime after ten o'clock, and uh, when I saw him. Uh, in the early morning at breakfast, and he was with me uh, all the rest of the time. Were you with Bobby when he heard of Monroe's death? Yes, I believe we picked it up on the radio. How did uh, Bobby react to the news? Well, uh, I, I don't recall any, any specific reaction. The car drove up, and then people got out, and I said, oh, there's Bobby Kennedy, and they went from the car to the house. That really is all that I saw. You're absolutely convinced it was Bobby Kennedy? Oh, I know it was Bobby Kennedy, yeah. No question of that in my mind. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was Bobby Kennedy, you know. <laughs> well, he wasn't there. As I understand it, he left by helicopter. 
going where? Back to San Francisco. He showed me his log. In the log, it showed that he had indeed picked up Bobby Kennedy at Peter Lawford's house on Sunday morning, somewhere around 2 o'clock. And he took him from Lawford's house to Los Angeles International Airport. Chief Parker told me confidentially that uh, Bobby Kennedy was supposed to be north of Los Angeles, some city, making a speech, but that actually he said he was seen in the Beverly Hilton Hotel in Los Angeles. On the night that Marilyn died? On the very night she died, yes. Why do you think that so many witnesses in Los Angeles would have told us and told the police that uh, Bobby Kennedy was in Los Angeles that day? I, I just can't speculate on their misinformation or their bad information or their what they think they saw or what they think they knew. But I, I just there's just no way he could have been in Los Angeles unless he had a twin. Isn't it odd that two key members of the police department at that time, that is the police chief himself and the chief of detectives, would both have been of the view that Bobby was there if... In fact, there was no evidence. I'd like to cross-examine them. I can't believe it. <laughs> Norman Jeffries, the uh, handyman that worked for Marilyn, said he had been there that night. And he said he was in Mrs. Murray's room. They were watching television when Robert Kennedy and the two men that were dressed uh, in suits arrived at the door and told Mrs. Murray and uh, Norman to leave. He said they just went to the neighbor's house and they were only gone about 20 minutes when uh, they saw Robert Kennedy drive off with the two men and they returned to the house. They went to the guest cottage and that's when they found Marilyn comatose on the bed and uh, that her uh, file cabinet had been rifled.